something. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Now then, UKIP is, quotes, ungovernable, quotes, and in a death spiral. So said the former leadership contender Stephen Wolfe, who, after being thumped, quit the party last week in disgust. My next guest, Suzanne Evans, author of the party's manifesto, has not, so far as we can tell, hit anybody at all recently, and she joins me now. Suzanne Evans, and what can you do to help UKIP recover? Well, I think I'm the right person to lead UKIP into the challenges ahead, to be able to beat the first-past-the-post system that we have at the moment by broadening our appeal and getting MPs into Westminster. Uh, but first and foremost, I think I'm absolutely the right person to champion the cause of those 17.4 million people who voted to leave the European Union and now seeing their democratic choice being undermined by the political class. So I absolutely want to be their champion. We're seeing hundreds of MPs trying to overturn the verdict. We're seeing a activist lawyers trying to uh, undermine the will of the people. And, uh, you know, I want to say to them, don't you dare. I will be there breathing down their neck to make sure that we have that tug of war. They're trying to pull us back to Brussels. I'm going to grab hold of the other end of the rope and make sure we pull us out to the EU exit door. Now, of course, you yourself are a bit of a controversial figure inside UKIP. Um, Aaron Banks and Nigel Farage have said things about you. You had to resign at one point from the party and be suspended for what they said was disloyalty. Um, and you've had a kind of war of words with other people inside the UKIP organisation. So why should you really be the unifier? I haven't had a war of words at all, actually. And do you know what, Andrew? I think nothing breeds unity faster than success. And with me at the helm, I'm absolutely confident, as I said, that we will be able to reach out to voters on both the left and the right of politics. You know, my background is, is one very much of a working class Labour background. My great grandfather stood for Parliament for the Labour Party three times at the turn of the last century. Uh, my, but you my, were a Tory councillor. I was a Tory councillor, exactly. And now I sit right in the middle in UKIP, and that is why I know that the policies we have can appeal. Look at the 2015 general election manifesto that we had a platform for. It was it was great. You know, it took the best of of politics. It took the best from the left, the best from the right. It was an absolute winner. The other parties couldn't touch it. Everyone I've spoken into UKIP. UKIP loved it. This is where our future lies going forward to be the common sense centre, not the wishy-washy Lib Dem centre, the okay. tough centre that controls borders, spends more on defence, cuts the foreign aid bu budget, slashes energy bills, so, all those kind of issues that really matter to So people. when you said that UKIP had to stop being the rugby club on tour, <laughs> what did you mean? I think, yeah, that, that there's other people had described it as the rugby pl club on tour. I said, I think, um, after the general election on this programme, talking to you, that perhaps at times there'd been a bit too much to testosterone in UKIP. And that's another reason, I think, I, that where I can help to sort of smooth or and pour see, oil on troubled waters. Nigel Farage, who has been a hugely successful leader of mm. your party, you know, did his bit during the referendum campaign, took you to a high point in 2014, says that you have been a hugely unpopular figure in the party because you constantly criticise the leadership and the party. Well, it's very easy to say things, but, you know, I've thought long and hard about this leadership bit. And one of the reasons I've uh, perhaps delayed announcing it is because I wanted to be absolutely sure that I have the support from members to stand. And I can confirm that I have more than enough signatures on the nomination form already to be able to go, go forward. Let's not forget that 3,000 people signed a petition in support of me when I was suspended. Um, I, I, I know head office was besieged with letters in support. I would not be doing this if I didn't have the backing of our members, because our members are the most important people in our party. Not the leadership, the members, the ones that go out there day in, day out, rain or shine, knocking on doors, spreading our but, message. But Nigel Farage, the most popular UKIP leader, isn't going to back you, is he? I, I don't know whether he'll back me or not, and that's actually C not important, Aaron, because Aaron we are Banks going into a new direction now. Aaron Banks, who has been the big funder of the party, is, back, is backing Raheem Kassan. Um, who is not somebody you approve of very much. Can I ask you whether you are worried that people like Aaron Banks and Nigel Farage and Raheem Kassan, who's involved with Breitbart, which backs Donald Trump, are taking UKIP in a slightly Trumpy direction? I think it will be interesting because in the course of our leadership election, we will have had the results of the American election. Now, I'm no fan of Trump, but I'm no fan of Hillary either. But I suspect that Hillary's probably just going to 
tip it. I go back to what I said before. You know, our future as, as a political party in Britain does not lie in that far right wing. I don't see a groundswell of opinion in this country for more far right wing policies. I don't see a groundswell of opinion for the right to bear arms in America. You know, all those kind of Trump. And do you think that Rahim Kassan, who looks to be like the front runner at the moment, is going to take the party in a far right direction, as you would characterise it? Yes, yes, absolutely. I don't think there's any doubt about that. And, and I, you know, our members don't want that. We've taken a lot of stick in you. UKIP, um, because perhaps we've had a slightly more toxic image than we should have had. And our members, as I said, the ones that are doing the campaigning, have felt the brunt of that, being abused, being physically and verbally assaulted on the streets. You know, they don't want uh, to have a, a fresh injection of toxicity that's and, going to make it even more they, difficult for them. They, they want think, policies that help us win. And do they think, and do you think, that Rahim Kassam is, ta is toxic? I think his, uh, you know, I don't share his beliefs. The members ultimately will make their decision. Mm. Um, in terms of where UKIP can go next, I think most people would say it's those nine million Labour voters who voted for Brexit that is your prime target. They may look at Jeremy Corbyn and Diane Abbott and think mm. that's not our kind of Labour Party. And in, in certain circumstances, they could come over to UKIP. But you, you may have Labour heritage way back, but you are a Shropshire county girl and you're a conservative candidate and you're not the kind of leader that's going to appeal to those people they need a northern rougher voice you're a little bit if i may put it a little bit margot from the good life for oh those my people. goodness me well you know i'm actually a girl who went to a comprehensive school uh, i'm a single mother um, I have pride in the fact that I get on with people from all walks of life, actually. And I'll be talking more about that in my, when I have my, my formal launch. But no, um, you, you hit the nail on the head, actually, Andrew. We are the patriotic party, and I'm nothing if patriotic and proud of my country. The Labour Party, you know, you've got Jeremy Corbyn who won't sing the national anthem. You've got Diane Abbott who wants okay. open borders. You've got Emily Thornbury as Foreign Secretary that loathes the British flag. You're right, we do have a very strong role to play in taking votes off Labour, but also from the Tories too, because somewhere like Hay Hayward and Middleton, the by-election... With, with respect, you know, you've been a complete mess as a party recently, certainly at the top. You've now lost your London HQ. Can you survive without Aaron Banks' money? You can't afford for him to walk away. <laughs> because he doesn't like it. Do you it. know what? Um, I have done my homework. And, of course, I wouldn't take over any organisation, let alone Britain's third largest political party by vote share, unless I was certain that our finances were solid. And I have been 100% assured that, actually, we're not doing nearly as badly as the headlines suggest. And, indeed, Aaron Banks is by no means our major donor. Uh, if he walked tomorrow, UKIP could survive perfectly well without him. Fascinating. Suzanne Evans will be watching with great interest. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Now, I said a little moment ago that uh, Stephen Wolfe was punched. We know he went down that uh, UKIP MEP, but we don't know he was punched. So apologies for that. I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Nigel Farage, just back from your trip to the US, where yes. you've been... Uh, observing the performance of your friend Donald Trump. I think we'll talk a bit about Trump in a moment or two. Yep. Um, but we've just heard on the Andrew Marr show Suzanne Evans declare herself as a leadership candidate. Mm. Um, but she also said that she thought UKIP's image had become toxic. Yeah, I mean, the last leadership election that we had, just a few weeks ago, we have them almost as often as the Labour Party now. Um, I didn't endorse anybody, I didn't criticise anybody, I didn't get involved. Uh, and I'd intended uh, not to get involved this time. But, you know, for her to talk about the party being toxic, for her to already declare one of the candidates who's running, uh, Raheem Kassam, as being far right, um, I don't view this as being a very good start. Uh, and I... I have to say, they're the sort of things she said to me. I mean, after uh, the general election, she said to me, I shouldn't take any part at all in the referendum campaign. I was toxic. Immigration shouldn't even be discussed with the British public. And I think she's been, she's been in the wrong place ever since then. I mean, she may, she may well think that herself, but that is not how UKIP members and UKIP voters feel. So just to be absolutely clear, you would be urging UKIP members to vote for any other candidate? Well, I won't be voting for her. Not after that, no. And... and um, she says UKIP needs to be in the centre ground. Mm. Is that how you see it? Uh, UKIP is a radical political party that pushes for change, change that it believes is going to be better for the country. I mean, very interesting. Many of the things that we've campaigned on for years 
and, and been told we're you know, w way out there, that this is not uh, what people care about. Much of it's now mainstream, whether it's campaigning for grammar schools, whether it's talking about sensible immigration controls, or leaving the European Union. And I would say this, that UKIP needs to go on being a radical political party. Um, just finally on, on Suzanne, um, she says that your HQ has been besieged by messages <laughs> urging her to stand. <laughs> you presumably go to head office from time to time as still the leader. Have you been noticed that there have been sacks of letters well, coming in? Not especially, but you know, she will have her own fans within the party. Of course she will. And you know, she project managed the manifesto for the 2015 general election when I was leader, and let's be fair, did a very good job of it. So I mean I don't doubt that she's got ability, not for one moment. It's just a question of political direction. And and I think to kick off this leadership election campaign by decrying one of the declared candidates is not perhaps the start that we needed. Now, um, you keep not perhaps in the best of shape. Uh, you have, you had a... <laughs> I think that's a, a somewhat sort of Sunday morning underestimate. Look, we've had a rotten couple of weeks. Yep. Uh, we had somebody elected as leader who had to confront the realities of what leading a political party is. She, yep. was, she was assaulted on Waterloo Station, and I think that, perhaps more than anything, is what made her think she made a mistake in running. Yep. We then had um, an altercation between two of our members, uh, and yeah, it's, it's, it's been a rotten couple of weeks, and we've got to get on now with this leadership campaign um, and get back on track. Just in terms of your own judgment, I mean, certainly I got the impression that you were backing Diane James to be leader. Do you regret that? I didn't say a word. I didn't, so, so, I, she I, was, I didn't, so she wasn't your favourite? I didn't get involved right. in it at all. I'm sorry it happened the way that it did. Yeah, it's, it's what, so why did she feel, in a sense, she obviously felt slightly coerced into running. She her heart <coughs> obviously wasn't in it. Where was that pressure coming from? Well, not from me, not okay. from me. But again, you know, everybody in a, in a political party has their own fan base, mm. uh, and she put her nomination papers in very late. Mm. Um, look, it's happened. It's gone. We've got to move on. On Stephen Wolfe. Mm. Um, did he let you know he was going to quit after this extraordinary altercation? In, in no. Dallas? No, and so, he, so you didn't have an opportunity to try and talk him out of it? He talked, he talked about the downward spiral of UKIP, but I'm sorry to say it's the downward spiral of Stephen Wolfe. Is he a loss to UKIP? He's a guy of talent and ability. I mean, I recruited him. He was working for the hedge fund industry. Mm. Um, he's a very able guy. Um, do you know, just sometimes ambition, too much ambition, gets the better of people, and that's what's happened here. Part of what he has been saying over some time is that he thinks that Theresa May has, in a sense, planted her tanks on your lawn and that, therefore, the purpose <coughs> of UKIP is no longer what it was. Has she, in a sense, undermined UKIP? Well, what she's done is she's raised expectations. If she then doesn't deliver them, uh, you know, you will find a lot of those people who are tempted by Theresa May will come back to UKIP. I mean, it's very interesting. You were chatting with the panel earlier yeah. about Theresa May's record. Mm. Um, and, and Quasi said what a successful Home Secretary she was. I mean, this is the Home Secretary, you know, who oversaw a complete failure in terms of immigration, and yet every year at Tory conferences gave tough speeches. I like some of the things that Theresa May has said. I like some of the direction of travel. But is she going to deliver? Because you were back in grammar schools, weren't you? She's, she's... Absolutely. We've backed grammar schools for years. A lot of the things that she's talked about are things that we've talked about. And do you My question is, can she deliver? She failed to do so as Home Secretary. And do you think she'll deliver Brexit? Well, I don't know. Uh, I suspect that... I mean, looking at Parliament, you know, we, we're hearing Nick Clegg and many other voices saying, we didn't vote to leave the single market. Oh, yes, we did. Everybody on both sides was clear that a vote to leave was to leave the overregulated single market. And I have a sense at the moment that there's probably a parliamentary majority in favour of us staying part of a single market. Now, if that so, so, happens... So, do you think we will, in this country, revisit the vote, then? I think that if Theresa May is serious... Uh, about delivering Brexit, about Brexit meaning Brexit, mm. which means we leave the single market, we get back British passports, we take back our territorial fishing waters. The only way she's going to do that, given the current makeup of Parliament, is to have an early general election and to fight it on those issues. If she doesn't do that. So the do purpose that, of, of, of UKIP now is to, in a sense, entrench the Brexit referendum vote, is it? I yeah, mean, very just... much so. I mean, I would say this to you if Brexit doesn't mean Brexit, 
by the spring of 2019, which is the timetable that she's given us, uh, then I think UKIP in 2020 could be a really big force. But, I mean, it's clear to me that you still have an appetite for all this stuff. Why are you... You're still leader. Why leave? Oh, well, I'm back as interim leader. I'm back on a temporary basis. You know, I thought I'd got away, but they brought me back. I don't back. think it's an interim leader. <laughs> you, well, your your is. name is still at the Electoral Commission. <laughs> well, it is, and, 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 and it, it, it wasn't removed for, for, yeah. for, for technical uh, reasons. No, no, I've been doing this for half of my adult life. Um, I had one big goal which was to push for, to attain, and to win a referendum. And we've done that. Uh, and I'm going to spend the next couple of years. Yep. I shall still be in the European Parliament. I'm still involved in politics. I just won't be doing it 24-7. But in, in the past few years, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think you've resigned twice and come back twice. So you're not going to come back a third time? Uh, is this it? Oh, no, this is it. You're never going to be leader of UP. You, you, uh, this, this is not old blue eyes or old... No, no. no. <laughs> this is not and the heavyweight boxer making a failed comeback. No, 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 I'm done with that. That, that part of my life is over. I've, I've enjoyed not all of it, but most of it. Um, and I think we've achieved remarkable success. It's now time for somebody else to take the party on. Aaron Banks has talked about creating a sort of movement mm. uh, to campaign for the sort of things that you believe in, but outside of party politics, a sort of momentum for UKIP, as it were, momentum being this campaigning group alongside Corbyn's Labour. Would you, yeah. would you join him in that? I, I, yeah, I, I think what Aaron Banks needs to do and wants to do is to build a cross-party campaigning movement that attracts Labour supporters and Tory supporters who perhaps would never vote for UKIP anyway, but, but to push, uh, to keep pressure on people uh, and to try and make sure that Brexit means Brexit. I think it's a very good idea. Welcome back to Peston on Sunday. Now, actually, I thought Diane James would be here, but apparently it's still Nigel Farage. <laughs> but first, Allegra, fire up Screeny. So lots of people out there on Twitter think that Nigel Farage has come out today to kill the leadership ambitions of Suzanne Evans, who earlier in the morning said she would be running. You've just heard, and you can see on this tweet here, uh, Farage slamming Suzanne Ev Ev Evans. For her to talk about the party is toxic, I won't be voting for her. And then we have big UKIP donor Aaron Banks. There was a tweet out there that said that Evans was all personality, no, politi no policy. And here Aaron Banks is agreeing with that. Exactly. A former B BBC PR person and good at presentation and that is it but let's look back to the big referendum most people most experts agree that what played highest one of the highest issues was immigration but why did it come from direct voter experience it doesn't actually look like it when people were asked recently uh, how many EU citizens they thought were in the UK, Remainers said it was 10%. The actual number is 5%. And then look at this. This is how many people in the UK Leavers thought were EU citizens. Here you have 20%, a fifth, compared to the actual number, which is 5%, Robert. If you look at those, mm. do you think you were responsible for whipping up excessive hysteria about immigration, since people no. plainly think there are more immigrants here than actually are the case? Oh, I think what's whipped up the hysteria is the complete irresponsibility of the Labour government opening up the doors to eight former communist countries in 2004. That is what has led to people is, feeling is, un is unhappy May, about this issue. Is Theresa May handling this issue properly? She's turned against your preferred route, which was a point system. Well, I think, the, the, you know, the beauty of the Australian-style point system is people understood it, because they've all got a friend that wanted to go to Australia that either got there or didn't. Uh, there are other ways of doing it, and I get that. Um, so you haven't lost faith in her yet in terms of her well, pledge well, to control well, immigration? Her track record is rotten. Uh, as I say, as Home Secretary, she completely failed on the immigration issue. Uh, we're going to have to wait and see. Now, tell us the truth about Trump. Are you advising him? Well, the truth is that I went to Cleveland to the Republican convention as part of my getting my life back strategy, having right. resigned as UKIP leader, and I was just stunned by how big Brexit was over there. Not just amongst the delegates, but just ordinary folk you met in the streets wanted to talk about Brexit and what it meant. Yep. And some thought it was brilliant and some thought we were crazy. Did you but have any opportunity to talk to him this time? I happened to be invited to go to Mississippi by the governor of Mississippi right. to talk about Brexit and what were the crossovers, what were the parallels yep. with the American elections. And just by happenstance, coincidence, yep. finished up meeting Trump, going on the stage with him. Um, I haven't endorsed him as a candidate. I don't agree with everything he says, but... I do think, in terms of direction of travel, he's right on several big issues. Do you believe these allegations that he abused women? 
Oh, you know, it's very difficult, isn't it? I mean, we've had all these sex cases going on for years, and some people are guilty as hell, and others have their lives ruined when they're completely innocent. All I would say about these allegations is, why didn't they come out earlier? Why did we hear none of this during the primaries over the course of the last couple of years? I don't know any more than you do what the truth of it is, but I find the timing of it really quite strange. So you haven't decided to distance yourself from him as a result of these allegations? Well, I agree with the direction of travel uh, that Trump is trying to take America in. You know, he's actually recognising the threat that ISIS face. He believes in national democracy. Hillary, Hillary wants the European Union to be a prototype for a bigger global union, you know, a free movement of people. Uh, so, so, no, of course, of course, I could never support her in a month of Sundays. Can he win? I, two and a half weeks ago, if you'd asked me that question, I'd have said to you, there are shy Trump voters, there are non-voters, like with Brexit, who are going to turn out, who the pollsters aren't picking. I thought two and a half weeks ago he would win. I think the Bush tapes have really damaged him. And at the moment, he's behind. He's not that far behind. There are still 16 days to go. It's, it's going to be tough, but it's not impossible. Now, on another big character who British MPs don't like, Philip Green, do you mm. think his knighthood should be taken away from him? Well, I don't think it's for MPs to, to you know, uh, have a sort of, you know, sort of virtue-signalling move to say, isn't this man awful? Uh, I, 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 th I think it's quite worrying. You know, if we start... I mean, I do feel the honour system has been degraded completely. Uh, certainly the House of Lords has been stuffed with hundreds of people. You know, there, there is a problem with the appointment of honours, but I think to uh, put people into sort of the court of public opinion via members of parliament is the wrong way of removing honours. But presumably he does need to sort out the hole in the BHS pension fund. Well, of course he does. Um, of course he does. And, and you know, it, it, the way he's behaved looks pretty wrong. Now, finally, who will you be backing to replace you? I, I, don't, I had no intention this morning of supporting or opposing anybody, and I find myself at odds already with one of the candidates. I think for now I've said enough. Nigel Farage. Thank you. Many thanks. So, let's have a quick chat with the awkward squad. <laughs> Gwazi Kwarteng and uh, it took all Jess. that I could not to run over and <laughs> shout in <laughs> Nigel Farage's <laughs> face for almost the entire time that he was speaking. So, so you... I do believe that there is smoke with fire in the case of Trump and that, you know, that there is no issue in your mind that the, this man is an abuser. The why, the why don't people come forward until it's convenient is the whole why do people jump on the sex abuse bandwagon. It's not a bandwagon anybody wants to do. And I will find Nigel Farage after this programme and tell him the millions of reasons why women don't come forward when powerful men control them. Also, the idea that Nigel Farage didn't come on here today with the express view of having it to decide on who's going to be the next leader. The whole, oh, I'm not going to get involved. You're it, such a cynic! Yes, absolutely right. I tell you now that he is a complete soothsayer. There's nothing authentic about him. He came here with a reason, and he got that reason really across. And he's sitting there smugly while Allegra is reading out the text about how he, they've already damaged her running. He is not a truth speaker, he's a spin merchant. Uh, Quasi, uh, Theresa May has to a large extent parked your party's tanks on UKIP's lawn. Do you think UKIP will struggle to well, the whole point of maintain UKIP, momentum? I know they're branded as UKIP, but it stands for the United Kingdom Independence Party. So what were they independent from? What did they want to be independent from? They wanted to be independent from the EU. That's what it meant. And now we voted to leave the EU. I don't see what the, what the point of them is anymore. And, that's, and you've seen that in the polls. I think they've halved. Uh, from 12% mm -hmm. to 6% uh, since the general election, yeah. and now they're at 6%. So there's, I don't see any real reason why um, they, should be, they should be agitating, and I don't see what they're agitating for, because they've won this campaign. We've had a referendum, and we've voted to leave the EU. I mean, Nigel Farage says that he doesn't believe that that vote is safe that he thinks that when sure. it comes to it and, and MPs wake up to what Brexit means, they will, either through a general election or even possibly through another referendum, I suppose, but he thinks through a general election there will effectively be a second vote. Do you think that's right? I think he's a little bit, uh, yeah. dare I say it, paranoid on this yeah. issue. 
I think that uh, the Prime Minister made what it very you... clear that Brexit means Brexit. I think within what, the House what, of Commons... What do you think, Jess, though? Do you think I we think will have to have another vote If this? anyone says Brexit means Brexit, hard Brexit, soft Brexit anymore, there's I'm going to start to no feel like I'm at nursery with my children. No, no, this no... is the country, no, and no, it no. is about time somebody said enough. I cannot no. sit with the newspapers every day and watch us march our country off a cliff no, this is and complete... then be told that Theresa May is a safe pair no, no, of hands. This is, this this is completely is, ridiculous. Is, you, you, I mean, it's Jess, completely to fair, ridiculous. To be fair... So should Labour so, so should, so should, 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 should Labour be campaigning on a position of a second vote? Um, I don't think that the that the country wants a second vote, and I think it even, would be in, a, even, even more... in a general election. Oh, an early general election. I genuinely don't think that there is a feeling out. I think people out there want us to get on with That's our right. jobs. That's right. And I think that that is the right attitude. I think people are sick of it constantly, that, that politicians have become so indecisive and so paralysed by popularity and seeking out popularity that we can no longer do what is right for our country. And there is very little bravery at the moment. And the no, idea that my children's future is going to be affected because Boris Johnson wanted a job makes me almost no. apoplectic. I mean, that, that's a complete caricature of what happened. People voted to leave. You would say that you're on that side. That, no, you would say you would say what you've just said. I mean, people. Come voted on, we're going to come back to this in just a minute because I'm going to pop EU. over, just get over to Allegra it. for a little bit of wisdom. <laughs> okay, okay, so over here, Brexit means the Brexit game. Loads of action. It is not exactly X Factor versus Strictly, but this week it does seem that there is tension. There is a divide between single market and the free movement of peoples. Donald Tusk and his Brussels gang are saying that they won't let us have both of them, but of course they would say that right now. So let's firstly look at this one. A very interesting poll came out this week. Come on, animate. There we go. And it showed us that, this is the first time it started to show this finding, that actually 45% of people thought it was most important that Theresa May got something on the single market. Let's not look at the detail of the language about that, but the single market and the economy versus 39%. So fewer people wanting something on immigration. So why isn't she looking like right now she will listen to them? Well, here is the answer. They then break this poll down by age, other things as well, but age is really interesting. You can see here 50% of people over 55 want controls on immigration. And the thing is, and you know this at home, but over 55s are the ones certain to vote. Anyway, so that is that. But then elsewhere on another of our gems, let me go back here. I think I go here. Have I forgotten how my... I'm going to press the close button and then get to this one here. So look, another issue this week is the immigration cap, whatever Theresa May decides, and whether or not it should include foreign students. Theresa May thinks it should, but almost nobody else in her cabinet thinks it should. She thinks that actually should include students in these numbers. If she gets her way, it will hit the stock of world leaders. Have a look at this. Of, of the current, not in general, but of current world leaders, 55 of them come from British universities. You've got Malcolm Turnbull from Australia, King Abdullah from Jordan, and Hassan Rouhani from Iran. Is Theresa May trying to take out the competition? Robert. <laughs> well, uh, Kwasi <laughs> and Jess are still with me. Uh, just on this point, yeah. because it plainly is causing tension in the sure. Cabinet, um, do you think Theresa May is right to include student numbers well, I think in the, her immigration control The reason that limits? student numbers are included is because of the OECD uh, deed and UN definition. It's an international definition of, of, of migrants, and she's saying... And but people universities, like, higher education is one of our greatest exports. Absolutely. So we but, don't, we don't, surely but, but, we but, don't want but, to but hit you, that. You're, again, having a binary opposition. I mean, no-one's saying that we can't have any foreign students. Nobody's saying that. All those foreign leaders will be able to come. It was just saying that we need to be able to have some sort of we cap. We don't want the poor sort. No, no, they're, no they're, we need to have a sort of cap. And we know that there are lots and lots of universities, some of which are very reputable and some of which are less well-known. Uh, and there are lots of higher education establishments which people apply to and, you know, they need to be... They need to have a sort of official this, sanction. This, this is going to so, run. Jess, can I ask on a separate issue? Mm -hmm. um, the Lib Dem surge in Whitney, is that something Jeremy Corbyn should be worried about? It does seem to be more of a Tory issue. They seem to be taking quite a lot of Tory council seats. No, hang on. Um, Labour was second in Whitney in the general election. Oh, no, so, no, I mean, no, 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 no. Labour it. membership in the area um, has increased. I mean, so it's sort of interesting that you get an increase in membership. Oh, yeah, it doesn't mean but an it doesn't translate in activity in yeah, or, or votes. Um, yeah. or votes. Um, I think that it, we should all be worried about the Lib Dems uh, surging, mainly because, you know, the sort of spineless middle ground that they were. <laughs> um, but the... 
I, I don't see much, as somebody who comes from a Lib Dem Labour marginal, I don't see much of a surge where yeah. I am oh, really? on the doorstep. Oh, okay. um, and actually, when it comes to a general election, they are, we are very much, you're looking for a figurehead. Now, there's lots of reasons why both the Labour Party and the Conservative Party might have to be worried about that when it comes. But at the moment, I don't think that the Lib Dems are in a position where the sort of figurehead will take them across the line at I think Jess election. is right. I mean, in my constituency, they were second when I was first elected in 2010 in Spelthorne. Uh, they, they did well. Last year they came fourth mm -hmm. and they did very badly. And I don't see on the ground them really coming back in a strong way. Okay. Um, a little bit of a swing back maybe to them, but not something which, uh, which I think we have to be overly panicky about. Kwasi, the big issue, the big decision this week yeah. will be on a London runway. Sure. What would you be hoping to see announced by Theresa May Heathrow? Well, I've always been very open about this. I think Heathrow, I've always uh, supported Heathrow expansion. My borough that I represent, Spelthorne Borough Council, has always been very amenable and favourable to the idea of Heathrow, you know, retaining its place as the number one international airport. And Jess, should Labour, is this a policy which Labour should mm. simply back? Um, I, I mean, I, I think that it's spineless on both sides of both parties that if we can't have collective decision making on issues as big as this for the economy and once again we have individuals own sort of desire to keep their jobs making but what, huge what is the right decisions. answer third runway for Heathrow I, I mean I would back one for Heathrow but I, I to be perfectly honest it's all very London centric to me um, but I think that the case has been made for Heathrow <laughs> just but, about but Theresa May, May has already shown that she is to use Jesse's phrase a bit spineless on this oh, like yet all, another delay not at all I mean look if we if we look at this issue there was a government white paper in 2003 I mean in 2003 you were probably at university I don't know what you were doing in 2003 but that was a long time ago and nobody has done anything on this and now Theresa May has said I was giving birth to one of my children okay, oh, and working me. forgive me it's all right forgive, 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 forgive me but in 2003 was a long time ago I mean maybe it doesn't seem like a long time to you but it, it was Not to me it sounds and, like it feels like only yesterday and, we've been, anyway, and yeah. frankly we've been debating this for 13 years uh, Theresa May has just come in the last three months and it looks like this week we're going to get some movement on this issue. So I don't think it's fair to some say... Some movement on this Hang issue? On. This, is, this, is, this, is, <laughs> this is the worst spin. It's been going <laughs> on forever. <laughs> now then, the race to discover who will be the next leader of UKIP is underway. And with the backing of the party's key donor, Aaron Banks, it looks like Raheem Kassam is the front runner. One of the candidates, Suzanne Evans, who today confirmed her own candidacy, said that she feared he would take the party in what she called a far-right direction. Well, Mr Kassam joins me now. A very good morning to you, morning. Mr Kassam. Well, let's uh, respond uh, directly. Let's hear it from you, from Suzanne Evans. Uh, she talked about that far-right direction. She also talked about not wanting that kind of toxicity in the party. I don't want this to be about personal attacks, and I was disappointed that 60 seconds into her campaign launch, she makes it a personal attack on me. I think this is about the future of the party. I certainly do not consider myself far right. Um, and I think she never considered me far right when she asked for my help writing UKIP's manifesto in 2015. So this is just, this is just politics. Um, and I want to get away from that. And I want to, want to talk about what the future of the party should be and what the future of the country should be. So I'm going to say to her, let's stop all of that. Let's come together as people who believe in Britain and actually knock our heads together and come up with the right solution. She can meet me whenever she wants. But do you think she's an asset to the party? I think she can be. I think there's no well, not doubt at the about moment, it. Then. I, well, I think there's no doubt when she goes on in front of television cameras and, and takes the party line on things and she can present them in a very reasonable and good way. But when she does things like this, it really undermines her, it undermines her campaign, and it's, it's an attack on a lot of the party members. There was a YouGov study that came out today that showed that the party likes the direction that Nigel Farage has taken it in. They don't want to compromise on that. And she's talking about compromising on it and being the centrist party. And I'm here to say that I would continue Nigel Farage's legacy inside UK. Mm. But, I mean, you're not a unifier, are you? I mean, you're pretty forthright about many of the, the personalities and members of the party, aren't you? I mean, are you serious about trying to unify the party or wouldn't you just want to get rid of them? I'm deadly serious. If these people, like me by the way, can be penitent sinners and say we've said some things in the past that we don't wish to stand so by. So they're sinners at the moment. Sorry Douglas about it. Carswell, I think a lot sinners. of us are. I think a lot of us are and I'm putting myself in that. But I think now, especially after that incident with Stephen Wolfe in the European Parliament, we have to say this has gone too far. We are all in the same party and if we wish to remain in the same party, let's sit down around a table together. He said in 2015, uh, after the general election, uh, looking at much of you, Kip, and thinking you were just a bunch of ragtag, unprofessional, embarrassing people who let Nigel down 
at every juncture. Are you saying things have changed or you've got to sort that out? No, it needs sorting out. It really does need sorting out. Um, well, this, somebody's going to have to go then, aren't they? Well, this is why, well, some structures need changing. The party needs a professional management board. It's, it's ludicrous that you have elected members of the National Executive Committee who fight their own seats across the country in charge of the finances and in charge of campaign strategy because they're going to favour their own seats and their own campaigns. It needs a professional management board and yes, that means some of the NEC powers will have to go and the NEC should be turned into a regional representation for the party. So yes, I am the only candidate, and I, be, I truly believe I'm the only candidate who is willing to go in there and say this needs real change. Okay, so if some of them can't deal with that, they go, and then you'd bring in the likes of Tommy Robinson. I saw an interesting uh, video of you on, on YouTube talking quite recently about Tommy Robinson, who of course is former leader of the English Defence League, uh, now uh, leading uh, or involved in Pegida uh, in the UK, uh, and you say you would consider having him in UK. No, I've never said that. What I've said is... You said he's a friend Deals. Well, I've said. Well, actually, what I've said is, he's a great source because I'm a journalist. I'm still a journalist. I'm. I'm doing that. I have to get in there. I have to get into these rallies, and I report on them, and we video them, and we interview people. And I've interviewed him twice now. And I actually even. I will say this myself. I actually stood up at the Pegida rally and gave a speech about Brexit, about Brexit, because it was ahead of the EU referendum. Um, Tommy Robinson wouldn't have a place in the UK Independence Party. Uh, I believe he's even said that himself. Unless he changes. No, no, no. See, my policy on the blanket ban inside UKIP has been very clear from day one. And you get all of the other candidates trying to spin it to journalists. This is how politics works. My policy has been very, very clear. Is that if you want to pay for your own CRB check, your own disbarment service check, then the party can sit you in front of a panel and you can make your case to them. But let me ask you this question, if you don't mind. Yeah, how, many, how many members of the far right do you think are going to join a party led by a chap called Raheem Kassam? Bubkus. Well, you said you're friends with Tommy Robinson. I mean, he looks like a member of the far right to me. Well, I think what Tommy did when he left the EDL was try and sever that tie. Um, that's not me defending him. I just, I'm, I'm interpreting that as a journalist. Now, do you think you've got the temperament to do this job? I mean, I've been reading your Twitter feed as well, and, uh, you know, I mean, it may have been late at night, the one I read, uh, when you were having an, an exchange with, as they call the, the trolls, perhaps, who were having a go at you. you. I think you were watching Newsnight together. You were using the C word, the F word, the S word. You were barring people. Do you think you could restrain yourself if you became leader? You know, my job has been to be a very combative journalist. My job has been to be a little bit out there, a little bit, um, a little bit, you know, get some attention, things like that. But nowadays, you know, 21st century, we live our lives in short bursts. You know, I've been a journalist, I've been a think tanker, I've been a comms director, I've worked for Nigel Farage. Right. You know, you move on and you can, you can be different people in your life. I haven't sat here my whole life and gone, I want to aspire to be a politician and therefore I'm going to carry myself like a PC robot. I've been a normal human being. And your question was, Would you, you use Anglo-Saxon swear words if people you become use leader? That, people, no, of course not, but people use that kind of language. You know, walk down any high street with me, you can hear it. You know, we're not, none of us are beyond uh, making mistakes like that. But it's about being able to own up to them and say, look, you know, I've done that, I'm not gonna do that now. I listen to this interview, you know, go away and look at my other interviews on television. It's not that, is it? Now talk about the policies. I mean, we've got to talk about yeah. uh, Calais and your, uh, your view on the uh, child refugees yeah. coming in. I mean, you obviously don't believe some of them are children for a start. Well, I would like, I would like the evidence, is all I'm saying. You know, uh, I think would the British public... testing, though? Dental uh, tests? Yeah, I think so. I think there has to be. And I, I would actually like that to be transparent process. I would like these records to go up on the government website. Obviously redacted. We don't want their faces. We don't want the names attached to these things. But we can show that these tests have been done. If the government can prove to the British public and calm all of this stuff down, then why doesn't it just do it? Okay. And uh, what about Gary Lineker? I mean, he's been very voluble in uh, supporting people, whatever age they are. I said it's basic humanity to be concerned about our fellow individuals in the world. People are saying, well, he's straight across the line here. He should be sacked by the BBC. What's your view? Well, I have never been a big fan of people who are in different industries and sports industry and things like that chiming in on politics. Um, I think they're, they're more than welcome to, you know. Just, I just don't think they have all the facts to hand. I'm not a big Walkers fan. I prefer the real McCoy. Okay, well, you obviously pre-prepared that, but do you think he should still be employed? Not, I did not did, know you were going to okay. ask me that question. Should he still be employed by the BBC? It's a decision for the BBC to take. Uh, you know, they, they have their own uh, structures inside, determining whether or not their people should do this sort of thing. I'm not, I, I don't care, personally. I, it's, it's not a big issue for me. You know, Gary Lineker... <laughs> All right, I'll that note, Reem Kassan. Thank you very much indeed. Very good to see you. Standing for the uh, leadership of UKIP. I'm joined now by Sky senior political correspondent Beth Rigby, the Sun on Sunday's political editor David Wooding, and the Independence political columnist Steve Richards. 
Very good morning to you. Well, there's never any shortage, is there, of material for us to deal with. Well, let's start, Beth, with uh, something, you know, that's uh, partly been generated on this programme just a few minutes ago. The UKIP leadership battle. And stat me, it looks like it's going to be messy. <laughs> another leadership battle, another messy lot of you kipping. I mean, it is going to be messy. You had Raheem on just now. You brought up all the issues he's had about how he behaves on social media, uh, things he's said about other uh, political leaders, some awful things that he said publicly on Twitter about Nicola Sturgeon uh, in the referendum debate. Uh, it makes him, by definition a controversial character but add into that that Aaron Banks the big UKIP mm. uh, funder is backing him and it therefore also makes him quite a serious contender uh, we also have Suzanne Evans and I think the thing about UKIP is you touched on that when uh, Raheem Hassan was talking about the national executive and how the party needs restructuring there are two very very distinct groups within the party there are the Far Farage gang and he's part of that as is Aaron Banks and then there's other people the modernizers such as the Douglas Carswells and even once this leadership battle is decided I just don't see how yeah. those two but sides it, can come I back mean, together. Even, you know, even if at the leadership level it starts to fall apart does it really matter I mean there's there's a demand within the United Kingdom for a party or an organization that is against the elites that's right. Um, the problem they have is uh, they're trying to reach out to the Labour voters um, and th they've got this slight issue here with uh, Raheem being of the right. Uh, um, he's more or less Nigel Farage on speed, if you like. Um, and then, then Suzanne Evans, who's a more um, moderate character who can't even decide whether she wants to support uh, Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton. She's a more on the one hand, on the other hand person. W which are they going to go for? I suspect that the UKIPers, the membership, which is who they're appealing to, will probably go for more of a, a right person at the moment. But whether that is the right person to take UKIP on and reach out to the working class people in, in the north of England, which is their stated aim, would be another matter. And, and is it the fact, Steve, I mean, you know, they've won the Brexit vote. Are they, are they going to struggle then to develop a wider range of policies that appeal? Yeah, I think they'd have struggled if they'd lost the Brexit vote. I think it's very interesting what's happening with UKIP. And it shows how difficult it is to form a sustainable political party. If you look at the Tory and Labour parties, they're the most fragile they've been in their history, both of them. And if you look at a very different kind of new political party, the SDP in the 80s, they lasted a few years and then imploded. And UKIP are discovering that political parties are awkward, complex beasts. You can't just depend on a single charismatic leader, i.e. Nigel Farage. Um, and yet, who have you got underneath and what do you stand for? And they're going through all these agonies. And I think even though there clearly is an appetite for these outsiders at the moment across the democratic world um, I think they're in real trouble well let me because I mean let me expand end, that and move on to be coherent moving to the next perennial issue so, sorry to cut across you Steve but you know it's the issue of Brexit now the yeah. interesting point you make about new parties because there's been talk for some time now haven't there you know and I was talking to Tim Farron earlier about a, a kind of reorganization perhaps around the second referendum issue those Labour refuseniks Tim Farron SNP and others I mean if that ever did come about do you think that would just be a loose coalition on on that single I issue? I think it would be a loose coalition on that single issue because on many other issues they disagree um, but on that issue there's unquestionably a coming together I mean to take one example uh, Ed Miliband who's been keeping a low profile uh, decided after visiting Hollande's people in France that they had to campaign for a soft Brexit in the Commons he phoned on the way back very out of character for him spontaneously a Tory MP and said we've got to get together on this she responded to his surprise wholly positively and within minutes had phoned others and so these Remainers in the Commons and elsewhere I think are coalescing around at the very least a sort of soft Brexit campaign mm. that doesn't mean a new political party but I think on that issue uh, they're going to act. Nodding there Beth is mm. there trouble ahead? I think I think there is and I think also what's really fascinating about that uh, splash in the Observer today is it's not just politicians now coalescing. This is about the banks. This is about the banks about yeah. uh, the banks warning 
uh, that a hard Brexit, if you like, an exit from the single market will have huge ramifications for the City of London, uh, warning that banks will move jobs out of London. Uh, there was a report actually from City UK, which is a lobby group, but it was done by independent consultants, warning that there would be potentially 10 billion of lost revenue in tax revenue from the city to the Treasury in the event of this hard Brexit, as they talk about. So I think that this coalition is not just political, I think there will be business. I think there will be a popular coalition as well of people that voted to remain. And I've noticed, yeah. I don't know if you've mm -hmm. noticed, but around London, uh, I often am getting mm -hmm. stopped now by people canvassing and leafleting about, are you one of the 48%? Do you want to join our movement? So I think it's a broader thing. But it's the important thing you say, you London. say around yeah. London, as David's picking yeah, up on, and also true. this coalition of business and the great and the good. Mm, they fought yeah. for remain during so the campaign and that, lost. I've always said one of the reasons that so many journalists uh, called it for Remain was because we live in a bubble, the Westminster bubble, which is in an, inside another bubble, mm. the London bubble. Uh, and a lot of people out there who voted uh, for Brexit who don't live in London and think that we're mm. all elitists down mm. here, mm. and with some justification in, in many cases. And I think that the, 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 the problem with, uh, for, the, for the government now is, do, are these Remainers or Remoners, if, you, if you're born to call them the other, the, uh, disparagingly, uh, <laughs> are they, are they Ha, uh, hindering the cause of, of negotiation because one of the problems David Cameron had was that he, he didn't ask for enough and he was being held back a little bit it is claimed mm. by civil servants mm. he wasn't uh, quite strong enough and, and if they're all coming out with reasons why uh, we need a soft Brexit that's playing into the hands of the European leaders who are but already I, talking about playing it hard I, and negotiating I, I, in French I, I, so I totally agree yeah. with that but I, and, I, and I think the, the sort of the mismatch between um, what, what's discussed here and then how Theresa May is, uh, is received on the continent shows there is this yawning gap between expectation and what they can deliver. But I think at the end of the day, in the months ahead, if the economy does start to contract, if businesses do stop investing, and I'm not saying that will happen. I mean, Nissan, mm. there's positive signs about the Sunderland. I'm not the saying that will mm. happen, but I think that will overtake the political impetus. But ultimately, does it lead? I mean, we're describing the stresses and strains already in so many months and years to run, but ultimately, Steve, I mean, does it lead to some kind of, some kind of vote? Or whatever shape of the deal, perhaps not a second referendum, but maybe an early general election. I, I, I Even if Theresa May has to use that to sort her party out. I don't think there will be an early general election. I, I mean, let's be precise, there's talk about one next spring. Yeah. Um, and although on one level it's obvious that she should do it because she's uh, miles ahead in the polls at the moment, I don't think there will be because what would be the courts? She won't know at that point what her Brexit well, deal would be. Well, could be. it be losing um, in the courts on Article 50? But that, that, that wouldn't be enough to... Tr I mean, what would she go to the country right. about? Um, and, and would it be with the support of her parliamentary party or would it be because she hasn't got the full support of her parliamentary party that she goes to the country in order to get a majority, in which case she would be partly turning on her own party, a bit of it, to justify the election. So I don't, I mean, I might be in a minority here. I, know, I bump into people all the time, not least Labour MPs, who think she's going to do it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't. All right, anyone else think she might? I, I think she won't. I think she won't do it either. I agree. Oh, with do Steve. you? Yeah, That's I do. I, I think. I mean, yeah. all the signs show that she will. But um, having, I had an interview with her just before the Conservative yeah. Party yeah, conference, I read it. And, and, and she was pretty dogged about it. And politicians always leave themselves a little bit of wiggle room. So no, yeah, I, yeah. I, I would say, in public and in private, everyone briefing very hard against that. And actually, a minister said to me the other day that part of the reason that was was for her. There's no benefit to replay all this blue on blue divisions in, a, in, an, in an election. That would why be the would only she, context why, of an early election. Why, and why yeah. would she want to do that? Yeah. She's, she's struggling. We can see that in all these, these briefings against the Treasury and how, you know, in the, the cabinet leaks, which she must absolutely hate. You can see how fraught underneath the surface of unity the party is. Well, let me throw Why in. Let me throw into the that? the issue of unity because you know Heathrow and uh, a decision about another runway in the in the southeast. Should we see that then that decision or non decision or long grass decision or whatever it's going to be through the prism of disunity and not wanting to rock the boat even more with another it, it's, issue? It's it's been an issue of party management all, for years now. I remember seeing David Cameron when he was leader of the opposition when he ruled out. 
Heathrow and said it would be impossible, it would never happen. And he did an article where he linked, he said we'd spend the money from Heathrow on high-speed rail or something. You know, there was some sort of contortion. It was all about kind of showing who he was at that point. And, and now, I mean, if what we read is true, that there's going to be a sort of, the cabinet can argue either way, which is always dangerous, as we've seen from Europe, and it goes on for another year. Um, I wonder whether midterm, which is where they'll be in another year, mm-hmm. they'll be in a position to take a really contentious decision. Um, if, if that's is that what it is? They're going to well, delay it for another yeah, year. I, I, well, we're in midterm well, territory we'll then. On, I think we'll get a decision on Tuesday. I suspect it will be Heathrow, but uh, contingent but, on a public. But, but then yes. But, but this was always going to happen. There was always going to be public inquiries and appeals and goodness knows what, which is why it's important to take the decision because it's been kicked into the long grass for so long. It has. And Heathrow yeah. has fallen from being the world's busiest airport to I think it's the sixth or seventh. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, but then Zach Goldsmith apparently would resign at, at yeah. some point. That would yeah. be an interesting by-election given yeah. what happened in Whitney with the, with the Lib Dems. Yeah, it would. And, but I mean, he's consistently said he would do that. I think she's going to have, a, again, an issue here because wasn't there an agreement that um, um, up until the decision or w- while that planning consultation is going through, people can, um, cabinet ministers can have a free yeah, yeah. Uh, voice on this. So you're going to have but another... But not in the House of Commons but, and not but, in... But you will have this other situation whereby uh, the government will be putting forward a decision and there will be a load of people on the ben- on the front bench. I mean, you'll have Justin Green and Boris Johnson uh, complaining against it. I don't actually see how in this situation she can do anything but give her... Uh, cabinet ministers a free vote on it, um, but it, again, it just it just speaks of splits at the top of the party at a time when she's going to be having to navigate through triggering Article 50. Uh, I, I think it's going to be a very difficult year for her. You know, the other big issue here is uh, the big political picture. Uh, Theresa May is talking about building a Britain that works for everybody, mm. and she's now finding she's not going to be able to please everybody because whatever decision she makes here is going to upset some people. Okay, yeah. it's starting to feel like that sort of John Major, you know, triumph in the 92 mm. election, yeah, and then and Maastricht just... came, and that triumph wasn't very long lasting, and it became very, very difficult. Yeah, I think it's going to be difficult for the, her. The other I mean, thing, she, she's uh, a substantial the, figure, but I think she it's going to be difficult. She is, but the one thing I would say is, if I was the Prime Minister in my first 100 days, and I had the level of leaking from the Cabinet, in that shorter period of time, that bodes Which is the honeymoon really, period. That bodes really badly for her. She should be able to control wow. her cabinet in a way that it doesn't appear to be doing. What's doing, this she's space? Not doing so. The inside word. Thank you very much indeed. Very good to see you all.